Numerous communities across the globe during the Second World War regularly experienced power outages in an effort to dodge air assaults, with all electrical forces in the region being struck off for a period. In Australia, however, brownouts occurred. Brownouts included a huge decrease in electrical voltage, although power could still be utilised, yet street lamps, for instance, would be faint. In 1942, a youthful American private positioned in the nation considered these to be a chance to assault vulnerable ladies in the hazy night time. Over the course of 15 days, the man murdered three Australian women, professing to have choked them to, quote, get at their voices. On the 3rd of May 1942, amidst a brownout, the lifeless body of 40-year-old Ivy Violet McLeod was found in the entryway of a shop close to Bleak House Hotel in Victoria Avenue, Albert Park, Melbourne, having been killed during the night, where she had been drinking to forget her woes. McLeod had isolated from her significant other and had hopes of having a fresh start. Initial investigations concluded that Ivy had been beaten over the head so severely that she had suffered a fracture and she had been choked with pieces of her dress torn and her private region exposed. McLeod had bruises on her eyes, on her right knee, both ankles and on her windpipe. Ivy was thought to have been casualty to a rape, however a post-mortem examination affirmed that no sexual assault had been carried out. No possessions of Ivy's had been taken either, and there was no other evidence to support the idea that the motive for the crime was robbery. As indicated by witnesses, an American man from the military had been seen with Ivy at a tram stop in Albert Park not long before McLeod's body was found. Six days later, on the 9th of May, at approximately 4am, 31-year-old vocalist Pauline Thompson was discovered deceased on the steps just outside of Morningside Boarding House in Spring Street, having been strangled, her garments also viciously torn. She had been in this area of Melbourne to sing for the soldiers to assist in boosting morale. The night before her body was found, Pauline had revealed to her significant other, a policeman positioned in Bendigo, that she was going to visit the Music Lovers Club to go out with some companions and an American private named Justin Jones. Pauline trusted that Private Jones would show up at the American Hospitality Club at around 7pm, but Jones ended up being around 30 minutes late. Pauline became fretful whilst waiting for Private Jones and eventually left and was seen soon thereafter with another American officer at the Astoria Hotel, drinking and having supper together. The duo left the inn located at Collins Place a brief time before 12pm, this being the last time that Thompson was seen alive. As the two strolled together, Pauline began to hum a tune, with the murderer lurking in the shadows. He interpreted the tune as a song for him. It later arose that the culprit murdered Pauline soon after she kissed him goodnight. The killer, who was given the name the Brownout Strangler, struck again nine days after the incident on the 18th of May. The body of 40-year-old Gladys Hosking was found in a ditch in Gatehouse Street close to Camp Pell, a military camp which at that point was under the possession of the US Army. Hosking, similar to the past two victims, had been choked and her garments had been torn. It was later confirmed that no sexual assault had occurred. Gladys, who was a secretary and assistant, had been walking home from her work environment at the chemistry lab at the University of Melbourne with her friend Dorothy Pettigrew, the two eventually parting ways on their routes home. Later that chilly and drizzly evening, Gladys was seen offering an umbrella to a trooper with an American accent. 
As per an observer, an Australian private who was guarding some military vehicles outside of Camp Pell, this American serviceman moved towards Hosking requesting directions. However, he was covered from head to toe in mud and seemed by all accounts to be exhausted. The description of this individual matched up to another witness's depiction given in Pauline Thompson's murder, as well as various different women who had barely avoided being assaulted by the American man. It was revealed that the suspect was disturbed whilst trying to shove a lady into her home, however her uncle scared him away. During another of these endeavoured assaults at a residence in Spring Street, the man was surprised by somebody in the foyer whilst another person shouted, resulting in the individual fleeing from the scene, abandoning a GI singlet engraved with the initials EJL. More than 15,000 servicemen at nearby Camp Pell were in a lineup set by Melbourne Police in a bid to identify the killer, and following almost endless hours of investigating, they did. The uncle of one of the women who had narrowly escaped the clutches of the brownout strangler and the Australian private who had seen the man covered in mud outside Camp Pell affirmed that the culprit was 24-year-old baby-faced American private Eddie Leonsky. Edward Joseph Leonsky was born on the 12th of December 1917 in Kenville, New Jersey, USA, to a Russian father, John Leonsky, a labourer, and a Polish mother, Amelia Harkovitz. Edward, who was known to family and friends as Eddie, was one of the youngest of five siblings, with three older siblings, Vincent, John and Walter, and a sister, Helen. Whilst Eddie was a child, the Leonskys moved from New Jersey to New York's East 77th Street. At age 16, Eddie left junior high and began a secretarial course in which he was in the top 10% of his class. In his days of youth, Eddie battled with menaces who teased him about being a quote, mummy's boy, which in fact was entirely true. His sister told papers that Eddie was her mother's, quote, prodigy. Eddie secured various jobs following graduating his secretarial course, including a delivery boy, an assortment of administrative positions and a grocery clerk. He was additionally very physically fit, routinely taking an interest in boxing and weight training, yet he likewise appreciated to flaunt himself and enjoyed being the centre of attention. When visiting bars in the city, for instance, he would do different gymnastic tricks, including walking across the bar on his hands to engage the people in the pubs. Leonsky's day-to-day -day life was far from ordinary. His dad, John, was a drunkard and was consistently oppressive towards his wife and children. He appeared to loathe the whole world around him and subsequently liquor addiction sent him to an early grave in the late 1920s. Eddie's mother, Amelia, experienced manic depression, and the children themselves fought their own battles. One of Eddie's siblings was admitted to an asylum, with two other siblings gaining criminal records. Eddie himself was a substantial drinker like his father, which brought about unpredictable episodes of rage. Eddie was called up for military service in the US Army on the 17th of February 1941, where he was first positioned with the 52nd Signal Battalion in San Antonio, Texas. During this time, Eddie continued to drink heavily. As indicated by a few reports, he loved blending whiskey with hot peppers, as it was one of his favourite beverages. During his time in San Antonio, Eddie had attempted to choke a woman named Beatrice Sanchez whilst intoxicated. The incident was disregarded by American authorities when they shipped him overseas to Australia in mid-1942 after the United States entered World War II. Private Leonsky stepped foot in Melbourne on the 2nd of February, where he was positioned with his regiment at Camp Pell Royal Park. While in Australia, his alcohol addiction worsened, and Eddie attacked a woman who lived in St Kilda. Leonsky spent 30 days in solitary confinement following the crime, and upon his release, he returned to drinking. 
As per his bunkmates at Camp Pell, Eddie was a happy-go-lucky kind of fellow. However, he was somewhat odd. He would often murmur about werewolves and Jekyll and Hyde. Many accepted that, similar to the rest of his family, Eddie was experiencing mental health issues. In the days following the murders of Ivy McLeod and Pauline Thompson, Eddie cried, apparently indicating regret for his wrongdoings. However, one night, when drinking in town with servicemen, he demanded that he buy a paper to find out about the Brownout murders. He even visited one of his campmates the day following Pauline Thompson's murder and advised him whilst weeping. You wonder about these murders, but I know. I killed. I killed. Leonsky's campmate disregarded these remarks as a type of odd joke, and Eddie went on to murder once more, the casualty being Gladys Hosking. Eddie endeavoured to wash his mud-soaked garments and shoes in the days that followed the murder. However, it appeared that he had run out of luck. The Australian private who had seen him in mud outside Camp Pell had informed his superiors of the strange sighting. The police looked through Leonsky's tent at Camp Pell and discovered some damning evidence. Small bloodstains and yellow clay on Leonsky's clothes and on his bed frame, a similar yellow clay found in the mud at the site of Gladys Hosking's murder, and a similar bloodstain found on the stairs of the boarding house. After Leonsky was picked from the police lineup as the one who had assaulted the woman and murdered McLeod, Thompson, and Hosking, investigators questioned him. Eddie admitted to his crimes, and he told the police his bizarre motive for the killings. He revealed that he had a deep passion for the female voice, particularly when a woman sang. Having heard Ivy and Pauline humming and singing, in his mind he, quote, needed to keep them. He also stated he was attracted to Gladys's purse due to its softness, and too felt the desire to keep it for himself. In an earlier conversation with an Australian private outside of Camp Hill, Leonsky had said that he had mud on his clothes due to falling in the park. However, he retracted this statement and corrected himself, saying that he fell whilst carrying Gladys's body. For the first time in history, following Leonsky's capture in May 1942 and subsequent charges, he was tried by an American court-martial in Melbourne. This was the first time that an outsider who had committed crimes in Australia was tried under the military laws of his home country. During the general court-martial, Leonsky was quoted as being cheerful, always grinning and joking during the proceedings. And when asked why he murdered MacLeod, Thompson and Hosking, he simply replied by shrugging his shoulders and saying, I don't know. Talking of Ivy McLeod, he said, She had a lovely voice. I wanted that voice. I grabbed her round the neck. I choked her. I choked her. In regards to Pauline Thompson, he said, She told me I had a baby face, but I was wicked underneath. She was singing in my ear and looking in my eyes. It sounded as if she was singing for me. She had a nice voice. We turned a corner. There was nobody around just heard her voice. I grabbed her and told her to keep on singing. I choked her. How could she keep on singing? I grabbed her. I grabbed her. I don't know why. I grabbed her around the neck. She stopped singing. She fell down. I got mad then and tore at her. I tore her apart. And in relation to Gladys Hosking, Leonsky said, she smiled, stepped back into the doorway and I seemed to step with her. I had my arm round her neck, changed the position of my hands so that my thumbs were at her throat, and I choked her. He made his disturbing motive clear by stating, that's why I choked those ladies. It was to get their voices. Leonsky confessed to pursuing four different women in an attempt to attack them, and confessed to having drank a lot of alcohol on the evening of each murder. However, he was not heavily intoxicated, in spite that others questioned the fact, as Eddie used to boast about drinking 30 laggers every evening. 
His defence went with the possibility that Leonsky was inebriated at the time he carried out murders, but was not of sound mind and couldn't be considered responsible for the killings. During the trial, the defence also focused on the Leonsky family's mental history. Eddie was sent for a psych evaluation and, following close assessment by three experts, he was declared sane. No notice was made in this assessment whether Eddie had any prior or hidden conditions which might have brought about temporary loss of mental or physical control. He was considered intellectually sound and was considered fully responsible for his actions. Leonsky was subsequently sentenced to death by hanging on the 17th of July 1942, with a date being set in the November of the same year. Following his sentencing, Leonsky said to the court, I have been wanting experience and this will be a new experience for me. Don't worry about me. I have been ready to die since I was 16. There will be plenty of experiences, I suppose, on the other side. Within his cell at Melbourne City Watch House, Eddie would read books, compose letters, draw, do crosswords, play drafts with the guards and utilise a wireless. He would also walk around his cell on his hands, just like he used to in the bars. He kept his mind occupied for the duration of his incarceration and appeared totally unfazed by his approaching execution. The night before the hanging, Leonsky was visited by Detective Sergeant Sid McGuffey, who was the one who had urged him to admit to his crimes. The two had an unexpected friendship, and as Sid left Leonsky's cell one last time, Eddie jested by saying, quote, Well, so long, Mr. McGuffey. If you've got any more dames you want choking, just bring them along and I'll fix them for you. Eddie Leonsky was hanged at Pentridge Jail at 6am on the 9th of November 1942, at just 24 years of age, with the Australian executioner the only person present. Leonsky's body was sent to the United States for burial before an autopsy could be completed, which leaves the question whether he did in fact suffer from some sort of mental or physical ailments unanswered. His body was buried a total of three times, twice in Australia, before the Australian government requested all bodies of Americans to be returned to their homeland. He was temporarily left in a mausoleum and military distribution centre before being buried in Schofield Barracks Post Cemetery in Oahu, Hawaii in April of 1949. Eddie Leonsky was not only known as the Brownout Strangler, but also the of mice and men killer, with many contrasting his non-abrasiveness and need for nice things to Steinbeck's character of Lenny Small. Likewise, he was known as the Singer Strangler and the Jekyll and Hyde killer. The crimes are seen by numerous individuals as symbolic matricide because of his mother's overprotective and controlling nature, as indicated by the psychiatrist who spoke with Leonsky preceding his demise. Despite his hatred towards his mother, Eddie also cherished her, and even supposedly wept when he understood that he was leaving her when confronted with the possibility of being sent to Australia. Leonsky's three victims were more established than himself, and around the age of his mother, which appears to affirm the idea that it was symbolic matricide. Leonsky's disdain towards his mother influenced his relationships with women significantly in his life. Leonsky never had a sweetheart, however he composed letters to a young lady named Renée whilst imprisoned at the city watch house waiting for his execution. One of Eddie's letters to his mysterious Renee, dated the 3rd of August 1942, concluded chillingly, quote, All good things must come to an end, so, with your kind permission, my whirlwind brain will turn over, tuck in its corners and go to sleep. Cheerio, and may all your nights be good ones, or good night. I remain my mama's little baby forever and ever. Edward J. Leonsky.